Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sayyidina, how are you? Oh, alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullah. I'm very well. Alhamdulillah. How are you? Alhamdulillah. I am well. Good. So for this discussion, we're going to talk about overcoming desires. And desires are something that me and you and everyone in this world have struggles with. So I wanted to see if you have any tips, any advice that you can offer us when it comes to overcoming said desires. It can be many different things like, uh, you know, we'll get into that, like food or temptations, lustful, temptations, so forth, yeah, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, I wouldn't be truthful if I said there's a way where you can never have any desires. We're human beings. The nature of humans is that we have cravings and desires and temptations this is built in us biologically islam being a perfect religion you are not a perfect religion unless you address every aspect of life has addressed this that you will find yourself whether it's in the small or in the large struggling with desires desires can come in waves they can come only during um shocks they can come in triggers they can come in certain specific relative manners. Now, having desires intrinsically, inherently is not haram. I might have a temptation, I might have a desire. It's not haram to have a desire. What, you controlled the desire? You told it to come? Sometimes we introduce them, of course, but there are times, biologically speaking, we might have a desire. You were deprived for the longest time from a nice warm meal you are craving it you can't force yourself to not crave it especially if you are triggered by something you might see or smell see touch taste just a glimpse of whatever and you're like oh that was delicious i want more my desires are exponential at this point there's that aspect you are not in the wrong for having them but sometimes we bring them upon ourselves because we place ourselves in situations and circumstances where we become more prone to having these desires. And a desire is similar to that of smoke, just one step away from flames and fire. You don't jump to consuming that prohibited thing or that illegal narcotic or whatever. You start off by having a desire for it. Then you decide to make that decision. It could be in forms of consumption and it can be in temptations like lustful desires lustful desires by the way again this is very important intrinsically they're not haram to have because they can happen involuntarily now if it's the wrong type of desire you could have a craving for something haram it's the wrong type of desire the fact that it became manifest inside you sometimes was out of your own control this becomes your jihad this is your internal struggle. The jihad and nafs, the greater jihad. Ever since we were little, we were always told the jihad and nafs, the inner, is the more significant than the one that involves combat and war because that's called the small jihad. But then the real big one is the internal one. This temptation inside me internalized is my jihad and nafs. Now I have to fight the urge. Now, temptations, lustful, sexual desires, and food and all these cravings they can be manifested in halal can they not they definitely can instead of that pulled pork excuse my examples that you saw on tv that looks good but you know is haram or that alcoholic beverage that looks refreshing they're all alternatives there definitely are there's a, there's a pulled chicken you know there's a, a nice iced tea there are alternatives you shouldn't necessarily feel guilty for having them these desires but you should control the type of desire that comes inside you, that is apparent inside you. It's better to have desires for things that are halal. But if you end up having them for something that's not necessarily halal, try to manifest it through halal. Sometimes people say, look, I can't help it. That looks delicious. That drink on TV, that beverage, that smoke, that whatever, that drug, the things I hear, DMT, what it does to you, the colors you see, the mood it gives you, that's tempta that, That's amazing. I want to experience that once in my life. You could also experience bliss and happiness and whatever these things give to you in matters that are halal. You know, fun. Fun is the goal. 
the means could be gambling, could be soccer. One of them was halal, the other one was haram. But the goal is the same, I wanna have fun. So why does a person wanna take a substance? Because of a desire they had. The desire says fun, the means, which does not justify the ends, says achieve it through this way. So to have an internalized temptation and desire is not haram to have. But it should always be driven by halal. If it happens to be through haram, that's your jihad and nafs. Subhanallah. That's your inner struggle, that surah, that war between your nafs and yourself. It's like, oh, nafs, chill. No. Hold back. What, what you want, first of all, is haram. Number two. When you want to get it accomplished, the only way to have it done is through haram as well. So I want something haram. Let's say an a haram act of intimacy. After I viewed something haram, I now have this urge. There is no way I'm going to do it through halal means of marriage. So I might pay someone suddenly. The temptation was wrong to have because it was triggered through haram because I watched something haram, let's just say. The means can only be now established by approaching someone in the haram way as well. Both the urge and the execution of that urge is haram. But it's just a fine hair that you can tune. The urge might be temptation lustful. But avoid the trigger that brought it in the first place. Fine. It w the trigger didn't bring it. It wasn't triggered. You didn't watch something. Most of us, alhamdulillah, we've never seen any of these horrible things. But sometimes we're born with them. We're born with temptations. What can we do? I mean, you want to... Make me feel bad for being a human being that has temptations, biological, God game. We can't adopt the life of celibacy as the Christian hierarchy of priests. They adopt that lifestyle, particularly the Catholics. And in their belief, they feel that this gets them closer to God, where they act celibate. They avoid all forms of intimacy. And that brings them to God. But you can also see the damages that does to a choir, to a pasture, to a group of people, the tarnish, the abuse that happens, and so forth. So we can't live that lifestyle either. There are ways to enjoy halal food. There are ways to enjoy temptations. So they're not haram to have to begin with. I think that's one way we should approach desires. They're not haram to have. If you have the haram type of desire, that becomes your jihad and nafs. You could still act upon that desire, even if it's haram. Initially, I saw something that was haram that I wanted. Instead of obviously doing the haram, I'm just going to do the halal alternative. You can still get this out of the way. So, desires are not that bad. And many times they're inevitable. It's a matter of your free will. How do you act upon this desire that you now have? You're faced with this dilemma. Honestly, you really are. And this dilemma is let not between anyone or anyone. It's between just you. Not between and it's just you. It's you and your nafs. And I understand that we have a great example with the hero of Karbala, Mawlana Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam, where he looks at his self. The nafs is the self. It's consciousness. It's the being. It's the I in the I think, therefore I am. It's that. And he starts conversing with it. He has to remind himself. When he gives himself these reminders, it gives him the strength. Ya subhanallah. So for example, he has that beautiful line. La arhabul maut idha al mawtu zuqa hatta uwara fil masaliti luqa nafsi li nafsi al mustafa tuhri wuqa inni ana al abbas. He's like, I do not fear death if death approaches. Myself, may it be sacrificed and ransomed for the son of the Mustafa, the pure. I am Abel Fadl al Abbas. He knows who he is, but it's the reminder. So he starts talking to himself and he literally starts addressing, oh self, oh self, oh self. He gives himself reminders. 
والله إن قطعتم يميني إني أحامي أبدا عن ديني وعن إمام صادق ليقيني. So he starts describing what just happened. It's as if he's conversing. These self discussions, these reflections are very key, very important. They open up a new wave of thought because now it's like you're talking to your younger self. You observe this responsible role like an older brother and you're looking at your younger self. Imagine you're looking at your kid's self and like, hey, don't do that. Don't be afraid of death when it comes near you. Stay firm on the way of the prophet. Defend his grandson. You're just tutoring, mentoring, shadowing. That internal discussion is the best way to get past all forms of temptations. And now, back in his example, alayhi salam, his temptations were just pure, natural, and beautiful. Wanting water. That's a beautiful. There's nothing it's not wrong. necessarily It's not haram. haram. It's no. not even necessary. It's act back necessary. Drink it. But he has a principle that is so commendable, so honorable. He's like, it is the biggest dishonor if I have this. And he doesn't have this. My master, I can't. For his sake. It's not that Imam Hussein wants him not to drink. Imam Hussein, of course, wants his family to be in top shape, to be healthy, to survive, to not struggle. Um, Imam Hussein would have wanted him, one may even imagine, to not struggle, which means go and drink. But he has this absolute amazing loyalty that turned into a foresight that we study until today. How many years has it been since the events of Karbala? SubhanAllah, it's been over a thousand four hundred years and we're just talking about this was a moment that turned into foresight imam al-sadiq says this he says al-abbas al-basira our uncle abbas had piercing foresight how does a person have amazing piercing foresight basira because there's basar which is the eye then there's basira which is the foresight you can be blind but you could still have foresight. And that's the eye of the heart. It sees and it pierces. It's amazing. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas manifested that on that day. And it's only done, this is an amazing battle, the internal struggle. It's only done after you've passed all these other tests of haram temptations. These are nothing. Once you get into the halal temptations and you still say no to them, when you could engage them, and it's not even haram, but you still gave a bigger priority in life. Water is halal, especially when you're dead thirsty. It's even more halal, oh my God. You still said no to that, lillah, for Allah's sake. That is a, honestly, I don't even have words for that. See, Abel Fadl Abbas, he's him overcoming this desire, like he is the best example of, Truly. of, of overcoming Because desire. you know, we're struggling to overcome haram desires. And it's such a battle. If you can get to a point where even the halal desires you're still saying no to because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake, because not all that which is allowed should be done necessarily. It would have been unbefitting. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas drinks water when Imam al-Hussein is thirsty. It would have been unbefitting. He is my master. He's my imam. He's the imam of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. My imam's thirsty. I'm going to drink. It's not haram, but it's unbefitting. When you start avoiding the halal because of befitting appropriate, unbefitting these cases, that's when you've made it to another level. And you can only do that by talking to your nafs. Speak to yourself as if you're talking to someone else. Give yourself motivational words, encouragement, advice, discourage it, don't be afraid of death, don't do this, don't do that. That struggle of the self is amazing when it gets to this point where these small haram things I used to think were temptations, I'm over, I'm past that, I'm past that. And it's not a surprise that Belfad al-Abbas comes from that family or a family where these temptations, they're nothing. They're nothing to them. They are on a level where they're looking at the halal and they're still saying no to you because they have a higher, greater priority. I believe in our lives, we can take the Abbas archetype. Self-assurance, talking to yourself. Literally do that. It's a quality of wise people, by the way. They would say a common trait associated with higher IQ uh, individuals, specifically geniuses, are that they would constantly be seen talking to themselves. They would speak to themselves. They hear their voice. They hear their thoughts. 
And I just have them. They manifest them by speaking, and they're like, that doesn't sound as good as I thought it did. Let me rephrase it, for example. This quality, clearly you see it viewed with Abu al Abbas, clearly you see it viewed with all these wonderful leaders of ours, these examples. We can take some of it, take some of it, and manifest it into our lives. So we talk about the battle between ourselves with the nafs, but what about when it comes to shaitan? Like when he comes into play, because he clearly has to have some sort of influence on our desires. Even if maybe it's halal, he can still, you know, have his little whispers yeah, to yeah. encourage us to do something that we don't want to do. Oh, absolutely. No, shaitan, sometimes he can't tell you to do haram. So he'll tell you to do a halal that isn't the most appropriate. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm not going to just jump and say, do smoke that whatever or drink that whatever or inhale that or ingest that or use that. He can't, he can't do that. It's not going to work with you or I. But what he can do is he say, hey, watch that movie where that's done. That's why some movies, they're not having an explicit scene, which is typically haram. Watching someone drink alcohol, just look away. Why? Because when you start normalizing that, then in person, you start seeing that, it becomes something familiar to you. He says, Let's keep looking, keep watching, keep watching. It looks good, it looks good, looks refreshing. I swear that sometimes I see I'm sitting with a few people. I hate throwing my friends under the bus. But these guys, right, the TV's on, right? We're watching a show together. Season finale, I remember, it was Game of Thrones. Horrible, by the way. Horrible that, that horrible ending. I, I for, still for, can't even We'll complain that. about that later. <laughs> So the commercial comes up and it was um, Bud Light, you know the yeah yeah the, the beer company whatever. Uh, I'm just I, I don't I'm, I turn away right. Everyone's dead staring. Well, turn your face, man. <laughs> what are we looking at? Two people making out? No, we're not. I'm like, but but relax though. It's just change the channel. Who cares? The detail they show it crisp. The ice they make you want it. The person is sitting on like a Bora Bora beach and he's drinking yeah. it and it's like, dang, that does look enticing. I'm like, these guys are just staring dead at it. I'm like, bro, change the channel. <laughs> change the channel, turn away or whatever. Who cares? It's not haram. So that's not the point. It's the desensitization that he then starts to play with you. You mentioned Iblis. Watch, watch, watch. In person, it's going to become so much more easy. Normalized. Sitting on the table. Normalized. Suddenly, you know what? It was really cold looking on TV. Is it really cold if I touch it? One thing goes to the other, and then you're innocently drinking suddenly. So he does play this very important role. One of the best ways to avoid all of these is to avoid placing yourself in such situations to begin with. Some people say, say, nah, I get these temptations and desires. Okay, who do you surround yourself with? Well, the lot, the people that you're with are constantly people that mention these things. Urges. We live in a hypersexual generation today. Your group of people cannot talk about anything except this stuff. Well, it's no surprise. Look at the follower list you have on Instagram. It's all models. It's all half naked. I was just half naked. It's all 95% naked individuals. It's like you're constantly exposed to these things. Of course, you're going to have temptations and desires. Then you struggle to find a potential spouse, etc. That self safeguarded their modesty for your sake. And you haven't done any of that for her sake, for example. The other way around too for sisters. The exposure of men justifying, well, it's not haram, the awrah of the guy is different from the girl, right? So then that exposure of the body can be a bit loosened. But that doesn't mean you can just start viewing with full detail a man and his figure and his form, etc. And the way he behaves and interacts. Avoid these things because these things can lead to other issues. It cannot be allowed if it will lead to somewhere else. That is haram relative to you. Because you have a different reaction to it than some, say for example, yourself, myself, or someone else. A cartoon character, for example. I'm not looking at a person. But if clearly common sense dictates something explicit is being shown, I have to turn around. I can't see that. It's like, Bubba, grow up, you're not a man. It's just a cartoon character. Yeah, but use common sense. It can still be a trigger. It can be a, it's a, it's a clear trigger. It's haram for me in that moment suddenly. And I see people, they justify these the nonsense like this. They're like, okay, well, you know what? Technically, it's on a screen. I'm not really looking at a human being. Oh, my God. It's like we're, we're turning into like, like that's such a pathetic thing to, to state. Common sense. Well, you know what? Common sense is not so common these days. But logic dictates. You need to know your extent, limitations, and what you can tolerate. 
everyone's a little bit different. So the range might be more for you, might be less for them. Always interact within your own range. And the best way to increase that range where all these temptations cannot affect you, the range of tolerance, by the way, Ahmed, that range, the order to increase it is to talk to yourself, speak to yourself, tell yourself, no, not now. Because it's like you're hearing another voice instead of the voice in your head. I believe mentally, even psychologically, that will have a reaction to you. You'll have a reaction to that. I heard someone else's voice. It happened to be my voice, but finally it's good to hear someone's voice instead of just the thoughts in my mind. Go through hours your entire day not speaking and only thinking. The moment you speak, it's like, well, who is that? That was me. You know when you hear yourself on a recorder, you're like, that doesn't, I don't like to hear that. Yeah, just like we're hearing ourselves. Yeah, you can hear yourself with, with these things. Hearing yourself has an effect. It genuinely does. So what can that effect be like when a self is struggling with temptations? Talking to yourself will help you because you know yourself best. Getting advice from someone is good, but ultimately the last person and the first person, the first and the last should be with you. You have the final say. So always give these reminders and always have that beautiful connection and inspiration. Draw it from the heroes of Karbala, particularly Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas in the struggle of the nafs, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah. Also, um, one more uh, thing that we can conclude with is maybe is there any supplications or narrations when it comes to overcoming these desires? Like I, we can always make our own simple dua when it comes to uh, for anything. But is there anything that the imams might have given us or anything that we know of? I believe there are many du'as, of course, of course. There are so many. And there are a lot of ayat of the Holy Quran that talk about um, tazkiyat and nafs, purifying of oneself. Um, you mentioned du'as, right? I can't help but think about just du'a kumail. Yeah. Particularly the line where it, you just need to be a little bit thoughtful about it. And it, it opens up beautifully. Where Imam Amin al begins to describe himself. And then you're thinking, if you call yourself this, who am I suddenly? Allahumma khfir li dhunub allati tahbisu dua. Okay, taqta'u raja. Allahumma khfir li kulla dhambin adhnabtu. Wa kulla khati'atin akhta'tuha sayyatin. You're thinking of these words of the Ahlul Bayt and you're like, Ya Ali ibn Abi Talib, forgive me of the sins that hold back my dua from being answered. That reflection Coming from Imam Amir al is a lesson for you and I. Because he clearly is pure. Allah taharahu tathira in the Quran. So these words are meant to be uttered by us, subhanAllah. So when I begin the opening words, Allahumma khfir li dhunub allati tahbisu dua From there onwards, I believe those are going to be healthy reminders for all of us. You're asking Allah, I have shortcomings, I have sins, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Forgive me of these sins. I will improve Ya Rabbil Alameen. These are healthy reminders because they come from the lips of the Ahlul Bayt. And I truly believe these are going to help with the Tazkiyat and Nafs, the purification process, definitely. Inshallah. You have provided us again with uh, a lot of great, useful information. Habibi. And uh, I really love Inshallah. looking at Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas when it comes to I truly like think this. so. I, and we mentioned Dua Kumail from his father, right? Yes. He, he is the product of that. So it's not too surprising. The apple does not fall far from someone the Someone who is a warrior on the battlefield and against his nafs as well. And against his nafs as well, subhanAllah, inshallah. We ask Allah to grant us the ziyarah of Abu al and inshallah. to allow us his visitation and his intercession and to be more like him in this dunya and in the akhirah, inshallah. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah, habib.